you have your Bible, turn to the epistle of 1 John. Don't turn to the Gospel of John, same author, but we're going to uh, look at uh, 1 John chapter number 1. Last week we heard <clears throat> the letter that Lance wrote, <clears throat> a story from a, a testimony from hell. And a lot of people looked at that, uh, been listening to that. As a matter of fact, we're going to put that uh, to everyone as an email uh, this week in a little PDF. So if there's somebody that you'd like to share it with, you can just basically state to them that someone in our church uh, wrote that. And uh, they read it in church, and it blessed you, and they might could get a blessing from it as well. Uh, hearing it spoken is... Um, um, sometimes uh, it was very painful, I'm sure, for Lance to be able to share it. Some, and, and, and it's hard to get, grasp it all in, but once you read it, I think you'll uh, really enjoy that even more. And, and it's something we need to hear. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. And Jesus told us it was a literal place. I know that there are people who think today that when you die, when you come to the end of your life, that it's just done and over. And it's just, you're just gone. They call that annihilation. It's just not what Jesus said. Jesus said that there was a different truth, and that truth, it wasn't real for them. Some people believe that, well, everybody's going to make it to heaven. They call that universalism, that God is love and everybody's going to make it to heaven. Well, it's not what Jesus said either. As a matter of fact, all the teachings of the New Testament say otherwise. Some say that, well, after a person dies, that they're going to be given another chance. Well, Jesus just really made that very plain. No, that's the reason why he spoke so much about heaven, but he spoke even so much more about hell. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ for us. That's the story that we love. And that's the story that we love to tell. It means something to us because it means something to us. You have sin. Well, Jesus made a way for that sin to be taken care of, to be separated as far as the east is from the west. You have been bought with a price, with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You have been redeemed. That's the cross of Calvary. You have hopes. You have dreams, but all of those will come crashing down unless you know Jesus Christ and have a relationship with him. But if you know him, he'll make those dreams become alive. Jesus made a way. You might have needs in your life. You might have things that only God can fill, a chasm of pain. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way. He is the only truth that lasts. He is the only life that is eternal. The gospel is the most powerful experience for any human being in all the world. It is all the hope of God, all the truth of God, all the love of God, every blessing that comes in the, in the nature of the eternal, it is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The most powerful thing in all the world today is what many take for granted. What many just say, that's just uh, so easy. Well, it is easy, but it is the most impactful. Nothing else even comes close to it. Anything else is counterfeit. It is the gospel that we need to be focused on. It's only three weeks away from Passion Week, four weeks away from Resurrection Sunday. This is a time when people are hearing the story. People are talking about it. In all of the church calendars, there's really two times that you're going to have everyone's attention. One is the month of December leading up to all that is said about Christmas, but there's so much misunderstood about Christmas. And the other is the month leading up to the Passion Week, to the time that Jesus went to give his life on the cross of Calvary, 
And what capped it all off was new life that came forward on Resurrection Sunday. That light, death was defeated. Life was given eternal. And we have hope because he came that we may have that life and we may have it abundantly. This is the greatest time to talk to people about the Lord. This is the greatest time to invite people to church. This is the greatest time to tell the gospel story. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Lord, we pray that this morning that you would help us see the truth of who you are and all that you've made available to us in Jesus Christ. My prayer, O oh Lord, is that we would hear directly from you, that you would draw us close, whisper to us louder than the clutter of life, ring the tuning fork in our heart. Let us see truly again the value of the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 1 John 1 says, that which was from the beginning. John also wrote the Gospel of John. And in the beginning of the Gospel of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in the 14th verse of John 1, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. We beheld His glory. The glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. The Word that was from the beginning became flesh from us. The living Word of God, eternal always, past, present, and future. The one who holds all life in his hands. It was manifested to us, and we beheld his glory. When Jesus began his ministry here on earth, he went down and found John the Baptist in the desert place. And while he was there, he asked John to baptize him. And he did. And later, John the Baptist said this of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, one of the disciples of John the Baptist heard this, looked to Jesus, and began to follow Jesus and listen to Jesus, and heard the truths that Jesus began to speak. His name was Andrew. And Andrew went to tell his brother, Simon, what, who we know as Peter, could this be the Christ that we've been looking for? They had two business partners that they fished with, and they told them the good news of Jesus Christ as well. And James and John became followers of, of Christ as well. And John actually became one of the 12 disciples. And more than that, he became one of Jesus' inner three, Peter, James, and John. They got more time with Jesus than anyone else. They, they, they got to see some of the things, like the Mount of Transfig Transfiguration and other things, that none of the disciples ever got to see. I mean, he had a close-up view all, the, all of his life. He actually had a nickname, too, the Beloved. He heard the sermons, and his heart burned within him. Jesus spoke with such power and with such authority, but with such truth and with such love. And not only did it ring true in his heart— he got to see how lives were being changed. He saw the miracles up close. The blind, the deaf, the lame, the demon-possessed, the hurting, all came looking for something. And he got the, the front row seat at the miracle and watched lives being changed, watched smiles go back to people's face, watch people who had no hope, who wondered what life was all about, only have question marks, thought that they did not matter. They mattered to Jesus, and he saw it up close. He saw how he loved. And he also 
saw him as he gave his life on the cross of Calvary. John was, as far as we know, the only apostle that was there. He stood beside Jesus' own mother. When Jesus spent that time on the cross, he only made seven sayings from the cross, but one of those was directed to John. He looked up upon him. He heard the crowd as they mocked and scorned. He watched people. When Jesus was on the cross, he was pulled down, but his feet were probably only 12 to 18 inches above the ground. So people could literally walk up and spit in his face, slap him, pull out his beard. And John, who only saw love in him, saw the hatred of how people treated him. But he also heard the story of the resurrected Christ. When Mary Magdalene ran back and said, they've taken him, his body is gone. Peter and John went running to the tomb. John got there first but stopped. When Peter got there, he just burst straight into the tomb to look. And then John walked in afterwards and saw that, that the garments were there, that the, the, or what was around his head was, was folded, the napkin was folded there. Not just like uh, an animal or something else that happened. It was done neatly and in order, and it impressed him. But later that night, that Sunday night, as they met in that upper room, Jesus just appeared with them. Didn't need the door. <laughs> he just appeared with them. But he was the resurrected human the Son of God who became the Son of Man, that they could touch, that they could see the scars. He saw the resurrected Christ. He witnessed the death. He witnessed the life. He was there when Jesus raised his hands and ascended back to glory. He was there in the upper room for 10 days when they prayed and waited for the power of God to come. He was there on the day of Pentecost when the, when the Holy Spirit came and filled them up and they told everyone else what they had seen and heard. It's been 60 years. He's now in his 90s. He's lived his life for Christ. He's the last disciple standing. All the others have been martyred, killed for their faith, willingly giving their life as Jesus willingly gave his life as well. At the end of the Gospel of John, when John wrote about the things of Christ, he shares why he wrote his gospel. In John 20, verse 31, the Bible says this, but these are written that you may believe. Do you hear that, church? This gospel was given that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name people begin to be saved. As a matter of fact, the books, book of Acts was written to show how the Spirit of God began to work through these new believers, and, and they didn't have anything to go by. All they had was the words of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. By the way, that's all we've got is the words of Jesus, the, the epistles of those who knew Jesus, and the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us. But there's one thing that you see throughout the book of Acts. Listen to me. It is that there was spontaneous service. I mean, yes, they worshiped. Yes, they prayed. Yes, they shared with everyone around them, but they served. Because they prayed, because they worshiped, because there was something new within them, they were always open. Listen to me, church. Always open. I'm going to say it one more time. Always open to be spontaneously obedient to the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. That's what the whole book's about. Living their life with the power of God, with the leadership of God, obeying God, 
And that's really what the epistle of 1 John is about. The gospel of John was written so that people would believe that he is the, the son of God and that believing they can have life in his name. But the epistle of John was written so that we would know how to live this life. So when we come here and we look at it, it says that which was from the beginning. I was there, John said, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes and have looked upon which our hands have handled the word of life. He said, the life was manifested. You'll see that word manifested all the way through the epistle. As a matter of fact, it's one of the most powerful words you'll see in all of the New Testament. It means to, to make manifest, to make visible, to make known. Whether by words or by deeds or in any other way, it means to expose to view. Listen, before Jesus, the things of God were, were, were veiled to a certain extent. They didn't see God. But when God came in the form of Jesus Christ, they could see him, they could hear him. They can lay hands on him as it says here. He was exposed, that which was from the beginning. Jesus unveiled to us. He made it possible that that which was beyond our grasp was now possible for us to see. In, in those first two verbs in chapter 1 and verse 1, or in what are called, listen to me church, don't, don't drift. This is what is called the present imperative. Why is that important? When a verb is in the present imperative, it means something that happened in the past that has continual action. In other words, something happened, but it affects today, and it has continual action in the future. What Jesus did, he did, but it's still affecting, and it will continue to affect. That's exactly what John's saying, which we have heard, and, we'll steer, and we're still hearing, which we have seen with our eyes, we can still see him, which we have looked upon. We'll talk more about that in just a second. And our hands have handled. That's a term for a, a person that's blind that cannot see, but they can only grasp as they lay their hands on it, and they touch it, and they feel it, and that's their perception of it. We heard him. We saw him. We were there. We put our hands on those things that were happening there. This is a first hand witness of an amazing act, the act of God's love. It blesses us. It was manifest. Remember that term I said we'd look at, which we have seen with our eyes and looked upon. It means to gaze. It means to look at it and study it. To make manifest, to be unveiled. An artist now, I've never had this done. I never have a desire to have it done. No reason for it to have, have it done. But sometimes, if somebody a whole lot better looking than me would go and have a portrait painted, right? And the artist would, would have the, the, the subject sitting, and, and they would sit. And after a while, they'd sit some more. And if they moved, they'd say, be still, be still. Don't move. And every now and again, they walk up and they get close to them. You know, they, I mean, they, they, they wanted to see every little angle of it, how the, the light would hit them. And, and they, they would want to study it up close. And it took as long as it took, folks. And, and you just gazed at it and stared at it and studied it. That's exactly what we as Christians are to do. We are, we are painting a life of Christ. I'm painting my own picture, and so are you, of our loved one. And every day we study him. We look into him. 
I might see something today I, I've never seen before. Have you ever picked up the Word of God and, and you read a verse that you've read 30 or 50 times before, but it's like there was something, somebody came in the night and snuck something in there that, that wasn't there before, and you saw it, and you, said, you were so amazed by it. Or the, the, the alarm went off in your heart, and, and the Holy Spirit was there and just blessed your socks off. Because you were studying him, you were seeing him, and you were knowing him. I don't know about you, but it, it's a thirst that, that for me I have not ever quenched. It's a love for me that I want to see him and more and more, more intimately and more known. The beloved John, he had heard the sermons of Jesus. His heart burned within him. But he had preached those sermons and he saw others' hearts burning as well. He had seen the miracles, but he had needs in his life as well. And the Spirit of God ministered to him. Oh, I want to tell you, he's the last disciple standing, but they treated him unmercifully. The story of John was that at the end when he was pastoring in Ephesus, trying to get him to, to hush and be quiet, they took boiling oil and a cauldron of boiling oil, and they were going to make a public example of him. And they put him in that boiling oil to kill him before all. They just couldn't kill him. Because God wasn't done with him. So what did they do with him? What do you do with somebody you can't kill? They exiled him to the Isle of Patmos, but that was okay. While he was on the Isle of Patmos, when he was worshiping on the Lord's Day, when he was studying upon the, the goodness of God, Jesus showed up. Aren't you grateful that Jesus shows up at just the time you need him? And the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows in my heart. The more I study him, the more I want to know But to many people, the life is still veiled. It hasn't been manifested. Verse 2 says, The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested to us. Eternal life. Y'all ever heard that term before? Eternal life. What's the very first thing that you think of when you think of eternal life? When I was a kid, it scared me to death. On and on and on and on and on and on and on. I didn't know if I was going to sign up for that or not. I didn't like the idea of just going on and on and on. But it's not just the amount of days how many of you know that the place Jesus talked about, hell, the lake of fire, it goes on forever too, and it's not going to be good. And I don't believe I'd sign up for that. But you see, the, this term eternal, it can only be defined by God. There is nothing else in all of life that can define eternal but God. Eternal life means that which is the very essence and the very nature of God. It is the goodness of God that has no end. It is the love of God that has no end. You, you've heard me say this. I firmly believe that when we get to heaven, we'll know more of the love of God than we know here on earth. But we're going to spend our time here on earth learning the love of God. But when we get there, we'll, we'll know more. But come on, come on. A thousand years, I, I'm not going to get into but just to describe this, I'm going to use years, right? A thousand years, we'll know more of the love of God than we did the day we got there. Ten thousand years, we'll know more of the love of God. A, a million years, we'll know even more of the love of God. A, a billion years, a trillion years, a billion trillion years, we'll still know more because, you see, the things that are of God are eternal You'll never fully comprehend all of it. We're going to spend all of eternity learning it, experiencing it, growing in it. If you think you're just going to get there and oh, I've checked this box off, man, at least I didn't go to hell. I'm good. Leave me alone. Let me go play golf or something. My goodness, you're going to miss out on it. You see, that's, that's your life 
that's being, your life is manifested, not the life of God. What you want, what you think, what you will, what you wish. How many of you know we need more than that? The life of Brian is not enough. The understanding of Brian is not enough. We need more than that. But come on, we've got it promised to us. He said that this eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. Fellowship. The word is kononia. It means a shared life. A shared life. I like the way Phillips translates it. He, he, he says, we want you to be with us in this. Don't miss this. We've got something together. It's a, it's a Jesus life with us. So what he did, Jesus ascended and went back to heaven, but he gave us his spirit to live within us. So within me, I've got the seed of love, all love. I've got the seed of wisdom. Not, I, I don't have all wisdom, but I've got that wisdom within me. And I get to walk out. Come on, church, listen. This is our goal here, walking up down New Holland here in Gainesville, waking up tomorrow morning, living your day. It's to walk with Christ and experience Christ in your day, to see the glory of God in your day, to have fellowship with him. That G, as Paul would say in Galatians 2, yet not I, but Christ lives within me. We are living the life of Jesus down here on earth. He was manifested to us. We've studied, we've gazed, we've looked at it. It's not what we want, it's what he wants. And take your Bible, if you have it, or you can look up on the screen. Back up to 2 Peter, the book right before this. I want you to hear what he says here in the first chapter. This is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life, and goodness. Do you like that? Let me say it again. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and goodness through the knowledge of him, that's Jesus, who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly, exceedingly great and precious promises. How many of y'all are good with the great and precious promises? Well, some of you may not be that though these, through these, excuse me, you may be partakers, that's the same word, fellowship, the common life, same word, kononia, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Why, are, why did he just take us to heaven when we got saved? Because he gave us an opportunity to walk the Jesus life out down here. Come on now, not the, not the Brian life. Not, not, not your life, but the Jesus life. When we get to heaven, we're going to be experiencing it fully and completely, the, the Jesus life. Y'all good with that? But he gives us time down here to walk it out now. But it's, So if your life's about you, if, if, if you're the one that wants to be manifested... You're going to miss out on it. Look in verse number 4. 1 John 1, verse 4. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Church, I, I literally can preach two more sermons only on verse number 4. Your joy may be full. The fullness of joy is in Christ. Everything else you chase is not going to make you happy. You're not going to find joy in it. You're not going to find contentment in it. I, I don't know why it is, but by the way, it's in all of us. We, we chase after our dreams, our wishes, our wants, our happiness, our peace, our thoughts. We chase after those things. But they're all counterfeit. And by the way, we've got those same experiences too. We've got those same testimonies. That, 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 that's not everything. We know it's not. So what are we going to do? This life was manifested to us. I'm going to share with you three things that I want you to get from this. Three quick things 
that I think John's trying to share. Number one, you will live the life down here and share what is important to you. That's what you're going to live and share. Whatever's important to you, that's what you're going to live. I'm going to make a statement some of you are going to disagree with, but you come talk to me about this. It's the Word of God. The gospel stands on two feet. Number one, Jesus died on the cross. The finished, completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Number two, it's the proclamation of the cross. It's the proclamation of the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this. This is verse number 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled the world to himself through Jesus Christ. Come on now. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You will live and you will share what you think is important. Now, why do you think the gospel has to be told? Because it's got to be owned. All right. If someone commits a crime and they're arrested and they're taken to jail and they're held in jail until they go to, to, to court and they go to court and they face the charges, and they're found guilty, then the judge will give a sentence. And if it was a, a criminal crime, that they can be sentenced to death. Now, now, folks, that's something that they committed the crime. They're guilty of the crime. That's what the, the, the sentence of the crime is. They are sentenced to death, and it will be carried out. But the governor... Here's an appeal. An advocate comes before the governor and makes the appeal. And the governor hears it, and because he's the only one who has the authority, he writes a pardon on it. Free and clear, the pardon. Hold on. But the sentence is being executed. It will be executed. Listen, somebody better get that pardon to him. Somebody better convey the message that there has been a pardon that is written, that that person, though they are guilty, though they are deserving of death, they have been set free from the sentence of death. And if the word does not get to them in time, guess what happens? If the word does not give, get to them in time, they are executed in their sins. Somebody has got to proclaim the cross of Jesus Christ. It's just as important as anything else in all of life. We have something that we have seen and heard, that we have looked upon, that we've laid hands upon, of the will of life, the word of life. But he tells us that we need to take that eternal life and we need to take that shared life of commonality with Christ and we need to give it. He says in, in, in 1 John, he sa I, I love this. He says, the life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. Church, that's what we're here for. Number two, what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the Jesus life or the you life? What are you gazing on? What are you studying? What are you experiencing? I, I went to evangelism conference this week, and a friend of mine was preaching. Two friends of mine were preaching, and one of them said a word that just reminded me so much. You know, we, we have the great privilege of talking to the Almighty and listening to the Almighty. Why would we pass that up? We have a, a great privilege we have the Word of God, and we can come before it. Nobody's going we can come and spend just as much time in here as we so choose to and want to, and think that is important. If we don't think it's important, we're going to pass it by. We'll mess it up. And we have an opportunity here to come and, 
and, and hear the preaching of the Word of God and have teachers that come and teach the Word of God. We have discipleship groups where we can come and be discipled and help disciple others. We have opportunities to serve and to give and to love and to share to worship together. We have an opportunity to do this together, but so many people just miss out on it because it's really not important to them. If you hear somebody talk about, I don't know where we're going to go eat today, if you found some place that was good, matter of fact, Lynn and I found us a new restaurant Friday night, and, and we went there, and it was good. It was good. And, and if somebody says, I just don't know where we're going to eat today, would you say, well, Good luck, or maybe you, may, you might say, you know what? We went to this place the other night, and it was fantastic. You're going to share what's important to you. Some of you ladies, you find that place, and you found the pocketbook and the dress and the shoes to match, and it all fits together, and it looks good, and Easter's coming, and you found out it's 85% off. You going to keep that to yourself? Somebody will say, you look good today. Let me tell you where I found it. 85% off. <clears throat> what are you focusing on? What's important to you? Lastly, is your joy full? I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus more than anybody else or anything else. I believe Jesus more than the advertising of the world. I believe Jesus more than the commercials. I believe Jesus more than the, the, what the headlines of the newspapers say. I believe Jesus more than everyone else. And I know that everybody else has the answer to how you can be happy and full of joy. But Jesus is saying, John, who was there, who bears witness, says the only way that you're ever going to really know joy is to know the giver of joy. How do you learn to love lost people? Let me challenge you. Find one scripture in anywhere in the Word of God that teaches you how to love lost people. I mean, it seems like it ought to be there, right? I mean, surely he's going to tell us how we can learn to love lost people. Keep searching. But let me tell you what you will find. When, God, when John wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote those first 20 chapters, and the 21st chapter looks almost like a, an add-on, just like an afterthought. Oh, oh, let me write this too. Jesus had been resurrected. He shows up one morning and he's cooking breakfast. He has another time of fellowshipping with the disciples. And then he looks at old Pete. Simon, Simon, do you love me? Don't you know Peter was squirming? Uh, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Simon, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. I think we're looking for somebody to tell us how to love the unlovely, how to love the lost. We're, we're, we're looking for some thing that's not there, but what has been given to us is Jesus has been manifested to us in all of his glory and honor. And we can gaze upon him. We can hear him. We can see him. Our hands can handle him. We know this eternal life. We have this common life together. And he wants to walk with us. And, and, and if we can put our study upon him, if he can be the focus of our life, if he can be the focus of our everything, then we will love the ones he loves. We will give to the ones he gives. We will share to the ones in need. We will, we will experience the joy of serving Christ. There's so many unhappy Christians because they're not focused on the King of kings and Lord of lords.
We need to be about the Lord's business, but we'll never be about the Lord's business. We'll never be about the Lord's business until we're focusing on our Lord.